Tonight we're going to discuss the book of Proverbs part number uh, da -da 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 -da, part number 258, Proverbs chapter 21, verses 4 and 5. And so these are the verses we'll discuss tonight. And high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but of everyone that is hasty only to want. So God willing, we'll talk about these two verses in great detail tonight. I appreciate y'all being here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here. We love you, Jesus, and thank you for your great uh, love. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence as you're always here every time we meet. Now, Lord, I yield myself to you at this time. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll give me your power. I pray, dear Lord, for the mind of Christ. Help me to say exactly what you once said. And I pray for every person here to have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. And Father, please do a work among us that only you can do. Bless those who are watching online and uh, speak to their hearts as well. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. So uh, we're going to give you 18 thoughts tonight. So listen carefully. And I hope uh, you'll take notes and, and, and just stay along with me as we go. I'll, I'll only spend five minutes on each point. 18 times 5. Y'all y'all not with it tonight. 18 times 5, that's 50, that's 100. Uh, let's see, 50, uh, that's 90 minutes. That's a, an hour and a half. Y'all with me for an hour and a half? No, yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You'll be sleeping after the first 30 minutes. All right. But no, uh, here, here we go. So uh, point number one, okay, verse 4, it says, In high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. Haven't you been enjoying this really good weather? Hasn't it been nice? Snowed on Monday, but then warmed up on Tuesday and got even better today. And so uh, thank the Lord for that. And uh, God is good. But uh, I'm excited about wintertime coming and going. All right. So anyway, um, and I look in a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. I'm already dreaming about daylight savings time beginning in March. That's what I'm already doing. And uh, see, hey, boys, do you need note papers? Do you have note papers? I, I know you just walked in. Do, do, do y'all have note papers? I, no, yes, no. Okay, Brother Alex, thank you. I appreciate that. Everybody needs to have note papers if you don't have, uh, especially the teenagers, and uh, make sure you have them. So, all right, number one, what God calls sin is always sin. What God calls sin is always sin. Um, and high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked, all three of these things. God calls it sin. So, and high look is, is when you kind of, you know, think you're better than other people. You kind of look down upon others. That's your attitude uh, towards them. That's, that's sinful if you have a high look. And then it says a proud heart. That means a heart that's filled with pride. Like in your heart, you're, 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 you're proud, all right? That's a sin. And then it says the plowing of the wicked. Now, the plowing is typically talking about the, the activity of the wicked. What the, what the uh, wicked people, they, they put their hand to the plow. You know, it's like the activity of a wicked person um, is sin. And so, again, we've always got to remember what God calls sin is always sin. It doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter what uh, humanistic philosophies are or uh, modern-day political correctness is. Um, what God calls sin is is always sin. So these three things here, a high look, a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked, God calls it sin. Number two, you never want to do what is on God's hate list. You never want to do what is on God's hate list. In Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, it's a very familiar passage that we've looked at uh, many times before, um, but the Bible says this in Proverbs 6 verse 16 it says these six things doth the lord hate yea seven are an abomination unto him um everybody's okay back there okay you got it okay all right so do y'all need pens i know y'all got papers now but do you need pens yes no brother ed can you help them out real quick i a minute ago i said every teenager needs to have note papers and y'all didn't have them and so all right brother brother ed's going to help you out real quick all right praise the lord and uh, there we go. Okay, number two, you never want to do what is on God's hate list. In Proverbs 6, it says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, 
and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift to run into mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. All right, so this is God's hate list. He says in the first six things, he hates them, and then the seventh thing is an abomination to him. Now, I've taught you this many times before. An abomination is something that's like, intense hatred all right so you know you could you, you could like hate something by not liking it very well but then when it comes to man you really hate something that's what an abomination is and so um, god says the very first thing he says on god's hate list it says a proud look the very first thing he mentions i cannot tell you how much god hates pride so you never want to do something that is on god's hate list you just never want to do that. And uh, God hates pride. You better, look, the best thing for you to do is to always walk with humility. Be humble towards God and be humble towards people. Um, you know, basically, if you want to look at it in, in verse number four, and high look is, is talking about having pride towards people, and then a proud heart is having pride towards God. All right, if you want to look at it that way, inward pride and then outward pride. And so outward pride is how you treat people. Inward pride is how you treat God. And God says, look, I hate it both. You're no better than anybody in this world. I, I don't care who you are. You're, you're no better. Uh, God doesn't love you more than he loves anybody else. And uh, pride would cause you to have arrogance or conceitedness or um, a, an attitude towards others that you look down upon them and, and lift up your head towards them or your nose, if you please. And then pride in your heart, man, that, that's, that's inside an inner pride. And that hurts your relationship with the Lord. So you never want to do what is on God's hate list. Number three, if you fear the Lord, you will hate what God hates. If you fear the Lord, you will hate what God hates. In uh, Proverbs 8, verse 13, now watch this now. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the forward mouth do I hate. All right, <clears throat> so God says, if you fear me, you're gonna hate what I hate. Now, again, when you look at that verse, pride, that's inner inner uh, pride, and then arrogancy, that's outward pride, you know, feeling arrogant towards other people. So God says, if you fear me, you're going to hate what I hate. And that's real important to understand. Um, people who minimize what God hates, you don't fear God. I'm going to tell you this right now. There's a whole bunch of things in the Bible that the Bible calls an abomination to him, that the Bible says where God hates it, you know, and I don't want to mess with that stuff. I mean, I just don't want to mess with it. You know why? Because I fear God. I respect him, and I'm afraid of disappointing him, and I respect his power. And if I engage in things or a lifestyle that God hates or he calls it an abomination, then I'm not in good standing with God. And I'm going to tell you this right now. I want to be in good standing with God. I, I mean, I really do. When I go soul winning, I'm amazed at people who just, just di di dis, uh, disallow for God in their lives and who just, I knock on their door and they're like, oh, it's just a preacher, you know, and that's all he is. And, um, you know, I, I, I knocked on doors last night with Albert and we went soul winning. And you know how I've, how I've said, you know, where sometimes I knock on doors, the light's on, and all of a sudden the lights turn off, the TV goes off, nobody's talking or moving, everything's quiet. Well, that happened last night. There's this light on in the living room and in the bedroom and through the window I could, as I'm walking up to the door, I could see figures of people walking around, knocked on the door, nobody came to the door, knocked on the door again, nobody came to the door. We're walking back down the sidewalk and I look back and all the lights are off, the TV's off, both rooms the lights are off, you know. And um, you say, why'd they do that? Because it's a church guy. It's a preacher that knocked on the door. And they don't want to talk to anybody talking about God. You know, there's just, there's just so, it, it's just amazing to me that, that, uh, that people do that. Um, you know, I, another thing that's amazing to me is I talk to people sometimes. I say, if you die today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? And they're like, no, you know, I want to go, but no. And I give them my testimony, you know, uh, 1980, a preacher showed me how to be saved and took him five minutes to show me, can I show you? And then they say no, because 
five minutes is too much time. That's just amazing to me. I mean, I, I'm going to tell you something. I fear God. I mean, I just fear him too much to get on his bad side, to um, mess around with anything that God says he hates. And so listen to me. Arrogancy and a high look. How you, your attitude towards other people. Don't ever be filled with pride when it comes to how you treat other people. And then having a proud heart, inner pride, your relationship with God. Don't ever have pride in your heart when it comes to your relationship with God. All right, number four. Listen to this statement. A proud heart will keep you from seeking after God. A proud heart will keep you from seeking after God. All right, look what it says in, in uh, Proverbs 10, verse 4. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. A proud heart. That's going to keep you from seeking. It says, through the pride of his countenance, he'll not seek after God. Will not do it. Why? Because of his pride. Listen, if you could just understand how dangerous pride is. Man, just understand it. Um, Lucifer was a created being by God. He was perfect in all of his beauty. I mean, just, man, he was magnificent. He was the premier angel that God created. But then until iniquity was found in his heart. And that iniquity that was found in his heart was pride. He said five times it's written in the scriptures, I will be exalted. I will ascend upon high. I will, you know, be in charge or sit on the throne. And he said five times the letter I. He was lifted up with pride. And it, it hurt. I mean, it hurt bad. For all eternity now, he's going to spend eternity in hell. And he'll never, ever, ever get to go to heaven. And he's the sworn enemy of God, um, the one that hates God more than anything else. And it all started with pride. He was the covering cherub. He covered the throne of God. He was God's personal bodyguard, if you please, if you want to understand what that means. And yet pride changed everything. I, I Just don't have pride, man. Just don't have pride. Don't have pride in your heart. A proud heart will keep you from seeking God. A proud heart will cause you not to get right with God when the Holy Spirit preach, uh, speaks to your heart through the preaching of the Word of God. A proud heart will keep you from reading your Bible every day. A proud heart will keep you from prayer. A proud heart will make it so that when God wants you to do certain things or live a certain way, uh, it, you won't listen because you're not interested in seeking after God. I saw a meme on Facebook recently, and I shared it. Uh, it, it goes along something like this. Um, someone who is hungry after God wants to seek God seven days a week, not just on Sunday mornings. When you're hungry after God, he's always on your mind. You want to live for him. You want to you serve him, and pride will get in the way. Next, uh, when the Lord returns, there will be no more room. There will be no room for pride. When the Lord returns, there will be no room for pride. Look at Isaiah 2, verses 11 and 12. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. All right, that day of the Lord. You remember, I've, I've taught you this over the years. The day of the Lord's not talking about, um, okay, it's talking about the seven-year time period that we've attributed to the future event. We call it uh, the tribulation period. It's not necessarily biblically accurate. It's called the day of the Lord. And the Bible says when that day comes, when the Lord comes back, he's going to rapture out his saints. And, and as soon as the, the, the day of the Lord begins, it says this, all the lofty looks of man shall be humbled and haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. And it says the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. So when he comes back and he lays waste to all the people on this earth that are filled with wickedness and filled with ungodliness and, and, and he pours out his wrath on this planet, there's not going to be one person not one person will be left with pride. He says, I'll be the only one exalted then. I've often said, if you know the end of the story, why don't you just embrace it now instead of have to wait till it comes? Just embrace it now. You know, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
why don't we just do it now? Just bow the knee to the Lord. Every day of your life, just bow the knee and say, Lord, I'm a servant. You tell me what to do. I, I've got no will in my life, and I want to live for you. And just, just if you know what's going to happen, you know, embrace it. I've often told people when it comes to being saved and, and how you live, if you know how God says you're going to live in heaven, why don't you just live that way now? You know, I mean, there's, there's certain music you ain't going to be singing in heaven. So don't be singing it now. There's certain activities that won't be done in heaven. So don't engage in those activities now. Just, just embrace it now. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be awesome. And uh, just, just live like you're going to live in heaven one day. Embrace it now. Next, number six, the only way for a wicked person to please God is to purge the wickedness out of his life. The only way for a wicked person to please God is to purge the wickedness out of his life. All right, so in Proverbs 21, verse 4, we see the plowing of the wicked is sin. And that, that's referring to the activities of the wicked. You know that expression, you put your hand to the plow when you're doing something? All right, that's the activities of the wicked is sin. And then it says the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright is his delight. All right, what God is saying is when a wicked person who is engaged in wicked activities and he makes a sacrifice, God says it's an abomination to me. So what that means is this. The only way for a wicked person to ever please God is to purge the wickedness out of his life. Now, not all sin is wickedness. You understand that? You all understand that, right? Uh, if, if you sin and make a mistake or do something wrong and then you feel bad about it, you say, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that word. You know, I said, uh, today I think I said Raiders one time. I shouldn't have said that word, Lord. I'm so sorry. And, uh, but anyway, uh, just tease it. But uh, I was in a meeting today in, in one of my work sites, and, um, we, you know, we were talking about uh, 12, 12 uh, steps of effective listening, and, and I was talking to them about how to be good listeners at work and stuff like that. And we started talking about the Broncos, how they're going to go 10 and 6, and they're going to make it in the playoffs now that we have, you know, Brandon Allen as our quarterback. And uh, I heard some rumbling, and I said, there ain't no Raider fans in here, are there? And there are three, men, th uh, three people sitting in the back together, raise their hands. We're Raider fans. And uh, so I had a good time cutting up with them. But I said the word Raiders, and I shouldn't have said that. But anyway, uh, but the only way, so wickedness is not just sinning it's not just simply doing something that's wrong it's it's more of a perversion of life you know wickedness is like um in, in, engaged in just re really whatever God calls wickedness and you know witchcraft is something that I think you could understand that God calls wickedness you know so you know engaging in that is not a good thing it's just not a good thing at all but there's all kinds of things that you would call perverted ways of living and that would be considered what God says is wickedness and a perversion from from what's normal and what's right now oftentimes when we think of perversion we think of morals and that's obviously included in that but that's not the only thing that's wicked and God simply says this the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination of the Lord then he says the prayer of the upright is his delight so what God is saying here is this if you ever want to please me stop participating in wicked behavior stop it stop that wickedness and then you'll have an opportunity to please him all right so we've studied verse number four I got to confess to you, the majority of the Bible study now is going to be focused on, on point number five, and we're going to spend the rest of the time. So six points on verse number four, and then 13, or 12 points on uh, verse number five. So look what it says here. The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but of everyone that is hasty only to want. I'm going to focus on that first phrase. The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness. Um, you know what's a, a big problem in our culture? Is we're lazy in our thoughts. We're lazy in our thoughts. That's why it says the thought of the diligent. Someone who's diligent. You can, you can equate the word diligent to the word disciplined. You know, listen to me carefully. If you just let your thoughts go with whatever direction your thoughts start taking you down that trail, chances are you're going to find yourself thinking about things you shouldn't think about. And you've got to be diligent about your thoughts. 
you got to make sure and not be lazy in your mind. Because if you just, okay, let me give you an example. How much time do you spend on social media? And do you just allow what you see on social media to control your thoughts? You got to be careful. You just, you just got to be careful. I'm not saying social media, you should never look at it. You just got to be careful. Don't let social media be your brain. You know, one of the things we've, re we've referred to the television set over the years is the zombie box. Have you ever looked at yourself when you're watching television? Have you ever looked at someone else when they're watching television? Chances are they do something like this. I mean, honestly, it's like the television set becomes your brain. <laughs> and, and, and that's why you got to be careful what you watch. Why? Because you're just allowing it to feed your brain. Now, I'm not saying television is sin. It's just a tool. But obviously, there are sinful things on TV, and social media is just a tool. But obviously, there are sinful things on social media. And, um, and with our internet access, especially with our phones, you, you could just be putting all kinds of sinful thoughts into your head. And you've got to be diligent with your thought life. So let me give you 12 things to think about when it comes to your thoughts. Number seven, keep evil out of your thoughts. Keep evil out of your thoughts. You're going to learn something right now if you hadn't already learned it. This is one of the reasons why God destroyed all humanity except for eight people in Noah's days. In Genesis 6, 5, it says, now we're talking six, chapter 6, man. <laughs> creation was chapter 1 of, of the universe. Chapter 2 was the creation of man. Chapter 3 was, was uh, the fall of man. Chapter 4 was was God introducing the salvation of man because chapter 4 of Genesis was uh, at the very last verse and then began men to call upon the name of the Lord and it took one chapter one chapter chapter 5 of man's behavior and then chapter 6 God said I've had enough with them I mean I've had enough with them one chapter in Genesis and look what it says and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and, and here's the uh, second thing, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So when God looked at mankind, he says, all you think about is evil. You imagine evil, and it's in your heart. You just think about evil things continually. And God says, it repents me that I've made man. I'm going to wipe him out. And the Bible says that God said Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and him and his wife and his children eight of them got to go on on the on the on the ark and uh but that's it you know the, the, there was one uh bible scholar that now I don't know this to be true but he said the world's population in Noah's day was in the billions not not like a hundred thousand people on the earth you know just a few people no he, he said it was quite uh, this one uh scholar said it's quite possible that um that the earth back then was kind of like the earth is now in the billions of people and um and and, and yet god says he, he said regardless of how many it was millions or billions it don't matter god says i am sick and tired of looking at man continuously having evil thoughts in his heart. I'm just going to wipe them out. So point number seven is keep evil out of your thoughts. Don't think about evil. Look, there ought not to be one thought in your head that wants to hurt anybody. You ought not to want to be a part of evil. Now, evil is hurting people. But wait a second. Wait a second. There's a second category of evil. And we don't talk about it much. Evil is sin with the intent to hurt someone. But there's a second category of evil, and that's the devil's world. The devil's world. That's what God calls evil. So it's possible that mankind absolutely in their thoughts just said, you know what, I don't want to think about church. I mean, obviously church wasn't around back then, but the house of God, the things of God, I don't want to think about the Word of God. I don't want to think about prayer. I want to think about what the devil has. I want to think about the devil's world. And that's quite possibly what really just affected God to where he said, I'm done with mankind. So uh, 
keep evil out of your thoughts. Just keep evil out of your thoughts. You know, sometimes I, um, okay, can I, can I be blunt with you tonight just for a second? Is that okay? Uh, you're looking at someone that you may not know this, but I'm an artist. It has been a long, a long time. I, I was involved in artwork when I was a teenager. My favorite uh, mediums to work with was, was oil, oil uh, paints and then pen and ink drawings. But I have an artistic eye. Do you ever wonder why the modern day artists today, a lot of times they have skulls, they have death, they have, you know, in their, in their artwork, it's like, it almost looks evil. You think that's just a coincidence? It's just art? Oh man, it's just art, man. You know, we got all, you know, why is it that the art represents death? You know, skulls and things like that. And, and, and why, do they, why do they seem to get into painting what, what many of us who are Christians would look at and say, man, that looks more like the devil's work to me than, than God's work. It's because of the thoughts of man. Okay, if you were given a brush and a canvas and someone just said to you, here's some oil paints, just paint whatever comes to your mind. Something's wrong if a skull comes to your mind. Something is really wrong if darkness and death and demonic stuff just comes on the, on the canvas. That's, that's an that's a indication of what our thoughts are. And, and here's what God says. It says, God, it grieved God that he made man. And, and, and part of it was every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, I'm not saying if you had a canvas, you got to paint a puppy dog. You, you definitely can't paint a cat. I mean, just don't even bother painting a cat. I mean, that's just not right. But anyway, but I am saying there's just something wrong when it's just like, here's in my thoughts, I'm going to put it on art, and it's just evil. It's just wickedness. It's just not right. Keep evil out of your thoughts. Number eight, God understands the thoughts of man. God understands the thoughts of man. Man, all right? So look over, please, at uh, uh, 1 Chronicles 28 and then verse number 9. Um, 1 Chronicles 28 and verse 9. It says this, And thou, Solomon, my son... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Let's read that again. And thou, Solomon, my son, uh, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. All right, so um, David was speaking to Solomon, and it says there in the middle, for the Lord searcheth all the hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. You know what? I'm going to tell you this right now. God understands you better than you know. He made you. He understands you. He understands your thoughts. And um, there's no, sometimes people say, nobody understands me. God does. God does. He understands you very well. And, um, and so realize that God's a source of getting, um, getting comfort and getting help. Why? Because there ain't nobody that understands you better than God does, and he understands your thoughts. It says there, the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all all the imaginations of the thoughts. Number nine, the wicked do not have God in their thoughts. The wicked do not have God in their thoughts. Um, look at Psalms 10, verse 4. We read it earlier. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. You know the problem with wicked people? God's not anywhere in their thoughts. I mean, He's not anywhere. Because why? Because if, if, if people would think about God more, then they wouldn't participate in wicked behavior. All right? So listen to me very carefully right now. Listen to me very carefully. Your life would be so much better if you're more aware that God is with you 24-7. When you're in that car driving and you're by yourself and you're thinking about turning on that radio station or listening to that music or whatever it is that you're doing in that car, You'd behave better if you realized God was sitting right next to you while you drive the car. 
You know, look, I'm going to tell you this right now. You would act differently if you really saw the presence of God everywhere you went. You know, wherever I go, people who have bad language, people who cuss, if they ever say anything like that in front of me, almost 100% of the time, almost, not always, but almost 100% of the time, oh, sorry, preacher, sorry, reverend. <laughs> and then they say things like, excuse my French. Was, do French people just cuss all the time? Is that what it is? It's like a sailor, you know, sailors cuss, French people cuss. Excuse my French. And, uh, but, uh, but, but the fact is, is when I'm in their presence, they're at least conscious of the fact that they ought to talk right. Well, guess who's always in your presence? God. Make sure he's always in your thoughts. Before you uh, succumb to temptation, before you go down a road that's, that's a, a, a bad road, think about, Lord, you're here with me right now. What should I do? What do you want me to do? Have God in your thoughts. The reason wicked people act wickedly is God is not in all their thoughts. Next, number nine. I'm sorry, number 10. Hate vain thoughts. Hate vain thoughts. In, in Psalm 119, verse 113, I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. You know what we are in our society right now? We are infatuated with that which is vanity. Um, when I was a kid, I loved playing video games. I really did. I loved it. I played Pac-Man. I'm embarrassed to say, but I played Miss Pac-Man. Um, Donkey Kong, Defenders, Space Invaders. Man, those were some cool games. But, you know, I could only, you know, I, I, I played them, you know, but, but I, I wasn't the type of kid that played them for hours on end. I mean, I, I, I just wasn't. I, I have a time period, you know. So recently, I, you know, I have this smartphone, and I, I don't have any games on here. I think my son Jack downloaded one game on it one day, but... <laughs> okay, all right. Well, regardless, I got like one game on there. And uh, so the other day I, I was going through Facebook and I saw this advertisement for a, a game that looks kind of cool, you know. It was like a challenge, like a, um, a game that challenged your mind to try to figure out a, a solution to a problem. And so I, I uploaded it or downloaded it or whatever you want to call it, you know, and I started playing it. Well, first of all, it wasn't anything like the advertisement. It was ridiculous. Um, but I started playing it for about 15 minutes or 10 minutes or so. And I'm like, man, I'm just wasting time. I deleted it off my phone. I just, you know, I don't understand. I, I, I can't just think about a game for hours a day. I mean, I, I, just, I just can't. To me, there's just, man, there's just too much vanity in that. I mean, if, you, if you're working so hard and you, you know, your life is so busy and then you take a break for 30 minutes and you play a video game and then, okay, you're, you, know, you, you let your brain kind of relax for a little bit, well, that's okay. But, boy, I know people that play video games for like 8 and 10 and sometimes 12 hours a day. I was out soul winning, um, uh, again, with Albert. I got to lead this, um, this uh, young, young girl to the Lord. She's 11. Her mom only spoke Spanish. And so I, um, I asked her if she had any other children, and, and one of her younger sons came out. I think he's eight. But uh, she goes, I have another one. I said, How old? 14. She said, he's 14. I said, w where is, where is your, your, I think it's a boy. Where's your son? And she went like this. <laughs> Just like that. I said, you think I can talk to him? And she went, oh. <laughs> he was in his bedroom just playing games. That's all he was doing. And he missed out on an opportunity of how, how, how to, at least at that moment, how to, how to get to go to heaven. Be careful with your vain thoughts. You ought to hate vain thoughts. Thoughts that have no meaning whatsoever to help you in your life. Thoughts that have no benefit whatsoever in your life. Just keep them out of your head. Hate vain thoughts. Number 11, the more committed you are to God, the better your thought life will be. The more committed you are to God, the better your thought life will be. Proverbs 16, verse 3, it says, Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. You know what that is saying? He says, if you would become a committed 
worker in God's kingdom, it'll help you with your thought life. When, you're, when you commit to God and you say, you know what, God, I'm all in. I am committed to the things of God and the kingdom of God. I want to be involved in your kingdom. And when you commit yourself, I'm not talking about, oh, yeah, it'd be nice to go soul winning, you know, when the weather's warm and there's, you know, no snow on the ground, there's nobody in my house, there's no, um, you know, uh, other thing, no football game on TV, there's no, you know, nothing. Okay, you know, like three times out of the year, there's nothing else going on, you can go soul winning. That's not committed. When you're committed and you're like, I'm involved, I'm engaged, I'm, I'm going to be involved in the ministry. Friday night, we need more workers. We desperately need more workers on Friday nights. Uh, Brother Zach and Miss Marissa, we've already got uh, at least two more visiting teenagers. They're going to come out to the uh, youth program this Friday night. They had 18 teenagers last, last Friday night. Just, just Zach and Marissa, and that's it. But, but they get two more, that's 20. I mean, how many more teenagers are they going to be able to handle? I mean, we need workers. But, but we don't just need workers. We need those that are committed. People that are saying, you know what, uh, I'm going to find a ministry and I'm going to commit myself to it. Junior church, bus route, nursery, ushering, um, RU, youth group, Spanish ministry. I mean, anything. Commit yourself. When you get committed in your work for the Lord, guess what God says? He says your thoughts are going to fall in line. You'll be, you know what that means? You'll be thinking about the things of God more than just when you show up to church. You, you, ought, to, you ought to figure that out. How often do you think about church? How often do you think about the things of God? Well, the more committed you are, the more you'll think about it when you're not here. But if you're not a committed Christian, chances are you only think about church when it's either time to go or when you're here. And so that's important. Number 12, forsake your unrighteous thoughts and God will show you mercy. Forsake your unrighteous thoughts and God will will show you mercy. Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7, it says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. You know what God says? If you forsake your wicked thoughts, your unrighteous thoughts, God says, I'll have mercy on you. Now, I don't know about you, but I need God's mercy in my life. I mean, I really do. Life is so hard to live. I cannot imagine living my life without God's mercy. Well, one of the things that's going to prompt God to give me more of his mercy is I have to forsake unrighteous thoughts. Now, think about that word unrighteous. You know what basically that just means? Not right. Not right thoughts. You know, in our society, we have an epidemic of people all over this country who have unrighteous thoughts when it comes to political items, when it comes to social issues. There's a whole bunch of unrighteous thinking going on in our society my wife and I were talking about liberal California by the way you better you better y'all you, better huh, huh. people in Colorado need to wake up and smell the coffee I mean seriously wake up and smell the coffee it won't be long before Colorado becomes California light in San Francisco listen carefully right now the mayor of San Francisco, I believe, is it the mayor of San Francisco, honey? The mayor of San Francisco just said, just recently, passed a law or made an made a, a edict that if anybody steals anything, oh my soul, okay, if, uh, I didn't mean to scare you, I'm sorry, and, uh, but if, uh, if, if, <laughs> If anybody steals anything less than, what was it? $850. Ready for this? You ready? If anybody in the entire city of San Francisco steals anything 
that's less than $850, the police are not allowed to arrest them. They will not be convicted of a crime. They will not have their day in court because they don't have enough police officers to handle all the crimes that are taking place in San Francisco. So if you go into a 7-Eleven and in San Francisco and you take a soda here and a bag of chips there, candy bars here and maybe something else over here and it adds up to 50 bucks and you walk out the door, don't bother calling the police. They ain't gonna do nothing. That's what, that is so insane to me. I mean, that's so unrighteous. It's just beyond, I mean, like if I was a business owner in San Francisco, I'd be putting my business up for sale or relocating it in another city. I mean, literally, you just advertise to the whole city. Anybody that steals anything that's in value of less than $850, you will not go to jail for it. We will not convict you of it in a court of law. We just don't have enough resources. We don't have enough police officers to handle it, so we're just not going to do it anymore. Isn't that insane? That is so unrighteous. I cannot believe how unrighteous our thoughts are in our country right now. How insanely hypocritical we are as far as the society and how because we don't like a certain person, we'll condemn them for an action that we think he or she shouldn't do while we're doing the exact same thing or while someone that we do like in politics does the exact same thing but yet we turn the other way with them. It is so unrighteous. It is so unrighteous what's going on in our country. And you know what God says? No mercy for that stuff. The forsaking of unrighteous thoughts is a requirement. My wife and I are just, we were just talking this morning and getting ready for school and stuff, just baffled that any Christian in our church would vote for people like that. Who in the world would vote for any, who, what Christian would vote for any politician that has that kind of unrighteous thought life when it comes to how our society is supposed to behave. If you steal something that's 750 bucks, don't worry about it. We're not going to come after you. I had, this, I had this dream. I had a nightmare last night. My truck got stolen. <laughs> Woo, that is a nightmare. And I went to the police officer and I told him about it. And I said, my truck got stolen. He says, well, we can't do anything about it unless they try to sell it. I'm like, what? You can't, I mean, my truck is stolen, can't you go? No, no, if, if they try to sell it, then, then we'll, we'll, we'll catch them. But if they don't, then I'm sorry, we're not going to do anything. I was so upset in my dream. Oh, my soul. That's just not right. But anyway, uh, maybe that's what's going to happen in our country. Forsake your unrighteous thoughts, and God will show you mercy next. Number 13, God's thoughts are higher than man's thoughts. God's thoughts are higher than man's thoughts. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Always, always listen to this very, very carefully. God thinks better than man does. And if, if God thinks a certain thing, and man thinks a certain thing, you always stick with God's thoughts because it's always higher than man's thoughts. Next, number 14. Oh, I love this verse. God has only good thoughts towards us. God has only good thoughts towards us. Look what it says. Um, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Ready? Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. What a wonderful God we have. You know, God says when he thinks about you, he goes, I only think thoughts of peace. I just want peace in your life. I don't want evil in your life. I want you to have an expected end. You know what that expected end means? It means all your dreams get fulfilled. That's what it means. An expected end. You expect an end to come, and it does. That's, God says, I want you happy. I want your... I want you to live life and have your dreams fulfilled. I want you to have peace and not evil. That's God's thoughts towards you. Every loving parent, you know what they think about their children? They just want their children to be happy. Every loving parent just wants their children to be happy. 
When a parent makes rules for their children to obey and things not to do and all of that, that's not because the ch a parent says, I don't want my kids to be happy. I want them to be miserable. No, that's not a loving parent. A loving parent says, I want my children to be happy in life. And that's exactly what God, our Heavenly Father, feels towards us. Number 15, think about, upon God, especially when others do not. Think upon God, especially when others do not. Malachi 3.16, I've read this passage to you many times over the years, but it's so, um, it fits so well right now. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day... When I make up my jewels, and I'll spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. God is saying, I, I've got this book that I'm going to write about all the people that, you know, uh, are thinking on my name while everybody else is not. And in this particular passage in Malachi 3, before verse 16, he talked about the evil of man and how they just don't, you know, they call evil good and good evil and it's vain to serve the Lord and what profit is it that we've, you know, sacrificed and fasted for God and, and then all of a sudden God says, those that feared me, those who thought upon my name, because I got a book, a book of remembrance and I'm going to remember what they did. Think about, upon God, especially when others do not. Number 16, we're almost done. Evil and sin first resides in the thoughts of man. Evil and sin first resides in the thoughts of man. Look at Matthew 15. And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draught. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth of the, from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart, ready, proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defile defileth not the man uh evil and sin first resides in thoughts of man okay you want to clean up murder in, in our society the answer is not getting rid of guns the answer is changing the thoughts of man somehow these people are thinking evil thoughts maybe it's the games that they're playing that they're killing all these people in the games you know when i was a, a an er, a younger pastor there was a, a game that came out that was shocking it was called um do you remember the name of that game, honey? Uh, talk about stealing. Grand Theft Auto. I couldn't believe it. Grand Theft Auto came out years ago, and it glorified killing people. I mean, just ordinary, average people. And it was just insane to me that people would sit there hours and hours and hours and hours and play Grand Theft Auto. Just insane to me. But somehow, these murderers, the problem is not guns. The problem is their thought life. And I promise you, if they would fix their thought life, if we would fix what people think on, it would fix a lot of bad behavior. Because out of, out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. That's what defile a man. And it starts with the thoughts. Number 17. <laughs> Learn to have mature thoughts. I wish I, could take, I wish I could sit down and tell every adult in our church about this. And I'm, I don't mean every adult here. I mean every adult, period, who comes to our church. Learn to have mature thoughts. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So much of what happens in society when it comes to friction between people, so much of it is immature thoughts childish thinking i saw this <laughs> i saw this meme on facebook i almost posted it myself but i saw this meme this guy was in a, on a stretcher being put into uh an ambulance and, and the caption was something along this line it said um the, this uh, pray for this man he heard someone who slightly disagreed with him 
<laughs> He's on a stretcher going into the ambulance. Someone slightly, slightly disagreed with him, and he, and, and he just couldn't handle it. Immaturity is rampant in our society. Can I tell you, a, can I just give you one sign of immaturity in adults? Just one sign. One sign in our society that adults are so immature is they are actually making cartoon movies for adults. That is a big sign that we are childish in our thinking. It really is. Number 18 and last. And by the way, that's been going on for years. Number 18 and last. Take control of your thoughts before they take control of you. Take control of your thoughts before they take control of you. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5, it says, Casting down imagination and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You know what that means, bringing into captivity? That means put handcuffs on your thoughts. Control your thoughts. Tell your thoughts what you're going to allow and not allow, and you bring your thoughts into captivity. But what happens is we don't bring our thoughts into captivity, and what happens is our thoughts take control of us. And that's why we have all kinds of misunderstandings. That's why we have all kinds of wrong behavior. That's why we, you know, we get mad at God or get mad at the preacher or get mad at the Bible that's why we have all kinds of craziness in our society when it comes to our thoughts because we don't have control of our thoughts. Our thoughts have control of us. And the Bible says right there, casting down these imaginations and then bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Control your thoughts or they'll control you. These are different things, 18 points tonight. Hopefully one or more of them spoke to your heart father thank you so much for allowing us to be here tonight what a joy it is to be in your house and thank you for the opportunity to preach and to teach your word and lord i just pray that every single person here tonight had an 